Let me know if you guys see it. All right, so now we are live streaming here on Facebook. Welcome, welcome everyone. I'm so excited uh, to introduce our Pushcart Poets Showcase. This is the very first time that we are doing that here at Red or Green Books. We are uh, co-doing it with The Word is Right, uh, W-R-I-T-E here on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, so welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I am going to be your host, Marissa Prada. I'm the founder and publisher for Red or Green Books, also the creative director for The Word is Right. So it's just a really fun way to get everyone networking uh, and uh, get these poets as much exposure as possible. So thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you for turning, tuning in. If you're watching live on Facebook, uh, you will find the live uh, stream on The Word is Right, W-R-I-T-E, as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, the word is right. Uh, okay, so some ground rules for today. This is not a an open mic. <laughs> so um, we're not going to be taking, oh good, here comes Maureen. We're not going to be taking an open mic list. Uh, the list is um, uh, just our six our six pushcart nominated poets. Uh, so in no particular order, we have um, Greg Michaels and his book, Urban Cowboy Poetry. Uh, so the, oh, these poets, sorry, they're just absolutely phenomenal. We have Maureen Medina's My Fears Out Loud. We have Coom Da Beanie by Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. We have Do I Look African Enough by Kimberly K.M.A. Anderson. We have Made of You by Stephanie Eisler Vance. Cover artists that we work with here at Red or Green Books, and we're so honored uh, to have them. Oh my God, Maureen, I love your little um, thumbnail picture holding your books. Yes, let's go. Uh, Greg has uh, Kuntabini. Uh, he's showing it. That's amazing. Awesome, awesome. Very excited uh, to have you all here. All right, so some quick ground rules. Uh, keep your mics muted, please, today, uh, unless the poets open up for um, any sort of Q&A forum. Uh, we do want to make sure we're keeping the background noise to a minimum. The chat is available for you to use but not abuse, so please um, take advantage of it if you would like to, but also um, don't be abusive with language. This is a brave space, right? I cannot guarantee anyone's safety. You're going to hear a lot of um, deeply personal and moving work from each of the authors today. Uh, I cannot guarantee your safety, but I can guarantee that this is a brave space to speak up. If you need to mute your, if you need to um, mute your your device um, or step out of the room, uh, we will totally support you in that. We don't, uh, we don't take that in it as a negative at all. All right, uh, please like, share, subscribe, follow to everything Red or Green Books and the word is right. Uh, we are doing uh, as much as we can to try to get these poets to the world. Uh, some quick announcements. Uh, the next Saturday, December 17th, is our one year anniversary at the word is right. Uh, it's the feature of the features. We've invited all of our featured readers back to read in one giant uh, evening of poetry. I believe we have 29 uh, features signed up to read at that show, including many who are here today. So come back next Saturday night, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, a different Zoom link. But if you go to the Word is Right Facebook, Instagram, you'll find it there. Also, we have our New Year's Eve show. Uh, so we're going to be dropping the ball each time zone in the U.S., uh, celebrating poetry in an open mic forum throughout the entire evening. So if you're not doing anything New Year's Eve and you want to come by, please, uh, please do so. We are in a huge push right now to get all of these books onto Goodreads. If you've not been to goodreads.com, please go. Um, a lot of the red or green books authors are on there. If you've not had a chance yet to leave a review, please do so. We are encouraging five-star reviews for these, for these poets. If you have not specifically read their book, but you've heard their work or you've read their book in some sort of way, please, please um, leave a comment about their work or how you feel about their work and review the authors. It's so monumentally important. You know, there's 11 people in the room. If if everyone here gave a five star review to each of the authors and they had instantly 11 more five star reviews, that would do a lot for their book. 
Um, you can also pick up all six of these books in a brand new bundle at redergreenbooks.com. Red is R-E-A-D. Um, all right, so let's go. Uh, so each of the featured readers will have 15 minutes, roughly, right? Y'all know me. Uh, okay, here comes Shaki. And uh, welcome, Christy Scribbles is in the house. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. So excited to have you. Leslie Constable, Diane Murray Ward is here. Uh, thank you all for supporting uh, these in incredible authors. Uh, and congratulations again for the push cart nominations. We will not know until next year. Uh, however, I did receive word and I cannot make an official announcement about who or what yet, uh, but it is coming soon. Uh, we have had one of our, our Red or Green Books authors receive an award this year for as very prestigious book award. Uh, so keep your ears to the ground uh, because we do have uh, we do have a, a winning book uh, here at Red or Green Books for the 2022 launch. So congratulations again, all who have been nominated for Pushcart. If you've been nominated for other awards and you happen to win, also let me know. Uh, we can do something very special for you. Nemo Sum is here. Welcome, Nemo. So glad to have you. All right, 15 minutes. We're going to start with Patti Orozco out of El Paso, Texas. Like, I have to just tell you, I've met this woman in person a, a number of times, and she is the real deal. I mean, they're all the real deal, but they're just um, delicately authentic uh, is how I would describe her. I'm going to just read... Um, here, I should do, I'll, I'll read the about the author and then I'll read one review for each of you so that um, if people are watching and they're not familiar with who you are, at least they can kind of get um, a little more information. Uh, here comes Jenny. All right. Patti Patricia Orozco is an unknown poet to most. Her heart is claimed by the written words of poets before her and her mind dwells in lines not yet written. Her introduction to poetry began with reading the writings of Edgar Allan Poe. His style of writing and pieces illustrated the depth of the mind for her and encouraged her to hold steady and dive, just dive into a world filled with poetry as means of self-preservation. Patti only hopes that you'll find yourself within the pieces of her poetry. Her story is within these pages and those still left unwritten. This is her way of you as the reader and keeper of her pour out that you begin to know her as she is. You, um, she is also a poet out of El Paso, Texas. All right, this is uh, Lee, Martinez's, Lee Martinez Soto's review of Patti's book. The author's delicately composed verses are stylistically formatted into pieces that will make you feel you are peeking into the author's own diary. Her poetry holds a sobering light on experiences with how we relate to and view ourselves and others by exploring mental health and mental illness, listening to and understanding our inner voices and critics, and revisiting the traumatic experiences that shaped parts of who we are in order to heal. The author does not shy away from showing the messiness of this process, a refreshing take for readers who wish to find poetry that does not sugarcoat such difficult subjects. This is her book. Y'all feel free to unmute your mics as we welcome up our first reader today, Patti Orozco. Woo, 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 woo. Oh, yeah. so funny. Okay. Everyone can hear me? Thumbs up? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No matter how much I practice, I'm always super nervous about self-promotion. <laughs> I always say I like to write because I hate speaking, <laughs> and I still find it very difficult to speak. I kind of want to, I'm going to be all over the place, mostly because that's just the way I am. But this is my book, Drunch Franco. I don't know if you can see it. I have a website as well. It's pattyspoetry.com. And you can always find me on Instagram too, just in case, at Patty's underscore poetic underscore life. And so I want to read from the beginning, actually, and I want to re read my note from the author. And this is my way of kind of disclaiming to everyone that you're about to go deep without putting like a full on disclosure on like it's an emotional mess, basically. So this is my note from the author from Drench Wrinkle, and it says, I do not want to apologize. I want to go deep, go deep within the chaos of the mind, the beauty of his disasters. I want you to feel. I want you to know that the heaviness of your feelings is true. For all these reasons, this is a trigger warning. 
These poems are journeys and each one might be surface level or meters deep below the touch of light. Feel, feel the feels, then come back up. And so one of the poems that I sent, I wanna go ahead and read that one straight off from the note from the author and it's titled Headspace. I found myself in the hollowness of echoing hallways, tiptoeing around the cemented edges, hoping, praying, the hammering in my mind would not repeat in the sound that followed with each step I took. I took with me a candle, the wick untouched, unlit, for in the presence of light is when shadows exist. I could not tell you the last time I heard my voice speak. Could dust lay itself in the carcass of a lung who knew not what breathing truly meant? Could air escape if it was never breathed? I closed my eyes in the dark to avoid seeing darkness. Ran into wall after wall, marking bruises on bruises, crawling down to my knees to lower a height I couldn't claim. If I've always known the same location, how could I possibly explain how incredibly lost I am without direction? And so that's the poem. And I wanna share a little bit about the book. <laughs> I wrote the book at the beginning of the year and I say I wrote it not in my lowest, but in one of the stages of my lowest. And so I realized by putting my words out there that it would be a constant reminder of where I was. And it was always a bookmark of where maybe I came from or a reminder of, I don't wanna go back there in a sense because of the lowness. I also realized that by writing it in this form, I was letting a lot of people in who maybe knew me, but didn't know me. So I had a lot of friends and family pick up my book and really kind of question what's, what's within you, you know? And so poetry gives us that moment of saying a lot of the things that we don't necessarily say out loud or things that we don't find the spoken words to be able to share with. And so I wanna share a piece that I wrote somewhat this morning actually, <laughs> and it's titled Writer's Remorse. My biggest regret is writing it in poetry. It's writing my pain in the sh shared line of a wilted season who blossoms itself into the vibrancy of colors that stain its waters. It's printing myself boldly on paper because of the inability to speak the colliding of worlds within the cavity of my chest and mind while all that anyone ever sees is trembling hands but no ground beneath their own feet moving. It's collecting fragments of myself into ripped paper bags. I almost regret, regret the entirety of myself in written form. Printed and constantly amending myself to fifth in an effort to dissolve a past that brings constant reminder into the question of a character who didn't make it past the opening credits. Because when they use your words, does it bring credibility to the future of tomorrow that ceases to proceed without your removal of syllables in the permanent fraction of undeleted stanzas? When writer's remorse sinks so deep within your soul that you almost despise all that you've written, even more the voice entrapped within your lips that didn't allow those words to be spoken as beautifully as an interlude in an opera scene where breathing isn't allowed. That sick, gut-wrenching feeling of saying too much, but you never said it. You wrote it all. So that's the poem. <laughs> and on that note, because I like to be very depressing in my writing, <laughs> I do, I do like to be depressing, but on a good note, I do want to share some experiences as far as writing the book, and that was in New York City Poetry Festival, where I got to meet a lot of beautiful poets in person. And the amount of gratitude I have for each one of you, those nominated and not nominated, is extended. It's a family brought together by the love of words and the love and the ability to share within each other and being that vulnerable state. So though I have a writer's remorse piece, I don't have remorse in the publishing part of it. I'm very grateful that I was able to put my words out there. And all of this is just stepping stones for each single one of us to get further, especially as a writer, and it opens so many doors. Um, so although a lot of my pieces are very depressing and <laughs> sad, I can write from light into darkness. And I think each one of us has a very specific writing style and the ability for us to jump back and forth just say so much about each single one of us. So this is props to all of you guys too, because we each 
give each other that platform to write. So I'll share another piece because it's too early to be mushy either way. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Obviously, I'm always nervous. So I'll write an anxiety piece. Anxiety spoke before I did. Wrapped my tongue in knots. Moments later, sorry didn't feel like it was enough. Saying sorry for the voice that sounded as my own but wasn't mine. Because of the entrapment in my own self, you could simply say you are your own bound. Simply find your way out. Anxiety is like that though, full of lies and defeats and inputting sorries where endings weren't thought of. Okay, so that was that little piece. And then didn't you credit of jumping all over the place. So another poem that I sent for nomination, titled Love, and a little backstory. This is a twisted description of love because I don't write love poetry. So, <laughs> love. Grains of salt waiting to be blown away by the whistling of the wind. Bricks made of fractured bones cemented with the dust of skin for the path the width of wind. Say the word love and claim the throne blows as worth, as justified means of your pain to find its way. Because judgment spoken in the eyes of love still find their slither in the word soggy with disgust. Tell me how love to find a salt doesn't taste bitter as it escapes between the spaces of your hands. If you'd never held me, how could you possibly know how the pulse in my heart knocks? Say love so you can take my unneeded limbs to the corners of the sea and demand for your rescue. Lean on the delicacy of my lungs while saying those are the moments that take the breath away. Salt defined as love to bless the taste of your lips. Laws of spaces and chain link fences on run on sentences. Love is silence. And that was that piece. And then just to prolong the whole talking. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to give a little backstory on Grunge Franco on the title. Um, when choosing the title, I want it to be something that it wasn't supposed to be, I guess. When you step out in the rain, a raincoat is supposed to keep you dry. It's supposed to keep you safe in a sense. And so I wanted the drenched raincoat as a sense of just being drenched in your emotions. Your body is supposed to keep you safe and yet your body is always attacking you in a sense where it may be your mind or physically or health or anything like that. And so when choosing drenched raincoat, I want it to explain that something that's supposed to keep you safe isn't keeping you safe. And so you're soggy and you're just pouring out all these emotions within yourself in a space that's supposed to be good, you know? So, and I did think of the title at work actually, as I was walking down the hallway with a friend, um, we were going back and forth and a lot of the titles are pretty ridiculous. I'm not gonna lie, they're horrible. But <laughs> Grand Durango seemed to work, and I have no regrets on that. The title, the book, the content of the book is beautiful. If you hear Christmas music, I'm sorry. My work is festive. I am not. But <laughs> it's okay. You can leave it. Thanks. Okay, he turned it off. <laughs> okay. Um, so the story of the book and all the poems is to display an emotion of just sadness and it's just to let everyone know that they're not alone because for so long I felt alone in those moments where maybe your emotions felt too much or they felt too high and so in writing the book I almost didn't want to apologize for going deep I almost I wanted to light in the darkness because of all the alone that I felt throughout the years and it wasn't anyone's fault it's just when you feel your emotions are bigger than you, it's almost like you have no place to go. And so in writing this book, and I thank my publisher, Marissa, thank you so much for letting me go to the places that I wanted to go without having to apologize either. And so in sending my book back and forth, there was no question on the contents were too much, you know, and that's up to every reader. But when writing your book, it was very important to be able to go out there. And so, I'll share another piece from the nomination thing as well. And then I'll probably be the last one too. It's called Cheerless Toast. To sitting in a crowded room and still having your heart ache of agony. To feeling completely alone while having the sound of breathing being pounded in your ear. 
to describing the feeling of having each and every one of your bones being pinned to the ground below and still being asked why you're screaming, to looking as calm as a field of unblown dandelions only to have the surging force of a stampede trampling vogue on what's meant to be the course through your veins, to saying none of this in fear of coming on as too emotional or too incapable of dealing with everyday life, of being too human, to running up the stairs because the elevator in your mind has stopped working years ago and your sense of direction is always pointed to lost or not using the full capacity of your lungs for fear of extending yourself beyond your reach and not being able to put yourself together again. We're speaking too loudly without saying one single word and being told to speak up when all you crave is silence. For me, for, me, for feeling completely and utterly unable and incapable and unjustified and unheard and untold and unloved and unseen and unheard, to sitting in a crowded room and feeling all alone. And that was it. So, oh my gosh, yeah. you guys, give it up for Patti Orozco. Oh my God, that was amazing. Oh, let's go, Patti. Um, Yes. So I'm very excited. You, there's, you know, you have two or three more minutes. If there's anything that you wanted to say, where can people find you? What do you have coming up? What are your announcements? How can they follow you? Get your book, all that stuff. Okay. So again, uh, website pattiespoetry.com. It took me forever to work on it and I'm not computer savvy. So just go on there and log on and just look at it. It's cute. It's really cute, honestly. Um, you don't have to buy the book, but you can just look at the web page. And if so, um, Instagram, preferably, because I don't know how to do stuff, honestly. It's Patty's underscore poetic underscore life. And if you have any questions, you can always send me a message. And eventually, and I say that very lightly, eventually I will respond because I suck at that too. But I'm there for you. And if you have any questions or anything like that, let me know. Um, I'm in El Paso, Texas. Um, thankfully, I've been able to get my book in certain little places, and I'll just stretch that out really quick. Um, I have my book at the Cattleman's Gift Shop in Fabens, Texas. I have my book in New Mexico at a smoke shop, actually, um, that's available there as well. There's an alien outside, but I always forget the name of the place, but there's this huge alien. It's obviously green. Um, there's a coffee shop on the west side here in El Paso, Menos, who has my book as well. Brave Books um, on Arizona Street in El Paso, Texas has my book. And uh, Literary a Bookstore on Mess Street in El Paso, Texas also has my book. And that's only been possible because I accept rejection and I went and just simply asked, honestly. And you bet I was nervous and I'm still nervous constantly. Um, my only recommendation is if you have butterflies in your stomach, just swallow them. Eventually you'll vomit them out. If you have any questions, please let me know. <laughs> and um, I, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and get out of that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, yo, Pat, the, Patty has totally impressed me with where her book is located. She just said something super, un, super important. She said, I accept rejection. Um, that is monumentally important for every single author to understand, right? Uh, the answer is no, unless you ask. So just ask. And she listed eight, 10 places that have her books. So wherever you are in your local area, go to coffee shops. Uh, she said it's in, a, it's in a smoke shop, right? Like, it's awesome. Uh, wh where are there places in your area, um, cafes, libraries, bookstores, but smoke shops, you know, craft places, where could you possibly put your book? Um, Lizzie and Patty, I think are, are some of the most prolific um, book networkers where where you can go somewhere and their their books in in double digit places so you know go and do that the other thing patty said was um be you know unapologetic that she was una unapologetic in writing her book uh certainly if you are going to have your book published if you feel you have to apologize for that work you know 
um, maybe it's not the best place for you to be launching your work. So make sure that you are um, 100% loving the vision of where your book is going. All right, uh, next up we have Stephanie Eisler Vance, uh, because these two ladies um, have to leave us early. Uh, they have uh, work duty, but the other four are going, we're going to draw to see who goes. So you can't leave if you're here to watch because you don't know who's going to be next, right? Uh, it's very exciting. Um, I met Stephanie Eisler Vance like I met um, Kimberly uh, and Christy and a bunch of other poets, uh, Maureen, um, on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just launching the books last year and I was like oh my god you don't have a book we should do you a book right and I'm sure at the time she was like I think I think in fact she said I'm not ready um or no I'm not going to publish a book uh like literally she just she shut me down and I was like oh, well okay oh you you plant a seed because this woman is just sensational and the world should hear her work uh that's what I thought when I met her and so um sh sure enough you know a couple months I think went by and she was like well maybe I should do a book and bam here it is right like it is not a freaking pipe dream y'all and and if you're like most of us who struggle with imposter syndrome or struggle with thinking our work is is good enough please understand your story is always valid it is always important and it always deserves to be on the page all right uh, so I'm going to read you her um her about the author and then read you one of her reviews and um let her rip it here we go Stephanie Eisler Vance is a writer, spoken word poet, educator, and mental health advocate based in Brooklyn, New York. After 11 years in the advertising media industry, Stephanie left the business to pursue her passion for writing and arts education. In 2020, she founded the Make Yourself Collective and NYC Kids, which fosters creativity and artistic skills for all ages. She performs her poetry regularly with Inspired Work NYC and the New York and Poets Cafe, among others. She has a degree in cultural anthropology from Duke University. This, her debut poetry collection, Made of You, is a realization of a long-held dream. Through the bare honesty of her work, Stephanie hopes to shed light on the full spectrum of reality of living with mental illness while reducing the stigma mental illness so often carries. She hopes to help others feel less alone. Her belief that art saves lives is literal. It has saved hers. You can find her at stephanieislervance.com and on Instagram, Twitter, and media at Steph Makes Faces. Here is, uh, here is the review of Made of You by Tara Boyd, off author of In Past Tense, Breaking the Circle, PA Inc. Coast. Made of You met my desire for honesty, vulnerability, and simplicity. Vance has a way of taking her everyday experiences and retelling them through her poetry in the most entertaining way. It was a pleasure to read and have the opportunity to get to know her on a personal level through her art. Please unmute your mics, y'all. Give it up for our second uh, Push Cart Poets Prize nominated author, Stephanie Eisler Vance. Woo, woo, woo. Stephanie. Stephanie, Stephanie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I am so, so happy to be here. Thank you, Marissa, for putting this together. Um, yeah, this is my book. And as um, Marissa did mention, when she first approached me about um, the idea, I had this like knee jerk kind of, oh, I'm not ready or, oh, I don't have enough, you know, work done, enough good work done. Um, but then she's absolutely right. That seed was planted. And I went back and I started compile things and I was like, Oh, wait a minute. I could actually do this. Um, and it has been an incredible journey. Um, and I'm so grateful to have been, to have shared it and to continue to share it with all of you, um, who have been part of the fierce 15. Um, and so like Patty, I, am. uh, I get nervous just talking. Um, my poetry, I find, is a space where I can be proper fearless. Um, so I'm going to spend most of this, my set, um, actually reading as opposed to just talking off the cuff because that makes me really nervous. Um, so the first piece I want to read 
is actually the first piece in the book and it's a bit of a long read. Um, it's like a seven minute read. Um, and, but it's also the, one of the most important pieces in the book for me. Um, it functions as both an origin story of sorts and a kind of mission statement. Um, it's a, I, the, the period of time I talk about in the, in the piece is something that I've written a lot about in prose. Um, and then when I started writing poetry, I decided to take a crack at it from a poetry perspective and, um, the results were, were pretty powerful for me. Um, so I hope they'll be the same for you. It's called how it started. It all started with started with a hand, a hand on my hand, thumb tucked underneath, stroking my palm. I was wasted in that liminal space between sleep and awake, slumped over in the back of the cab. He was just taking me home. I knew him well. Skateboarder pal down the dormitory hall already spoken for, but always kicked it just the two of us off to the side at parties. When I woke up, all I could think of was his hand on my hand. Only after that night did I know that tenderness was available to me. It started with too many lines of cocaine, sideways glances, giggles over nothing with my newly single friend, a full year of my own personal will they, won't they, my friends never told me to shut up, they should have. This cab ride at dawn was not tender, malfunctioning magnets neither repelling nor attracting, we danced around each other instead, embarrassing and more than a little exciting. I needed him to love me. He did, but he preferred that love at a distance as many had and many would after him. I have never understood this. Am I prettier from a distance? The cracks not so visible, the world more livable when you love something broken and beautiful from way over there. That is what we call a failure of imagination. Mine can fill that distance, weave a road paved in golden wishes, impossible conversations and deep kisses. This distance may protect you. You may think it protects me. Me, but the invisible labor in traversing it turns these hands to ash, lips into vipers, cracks already there groaning from the strain. This distance may protect you. It is destroying me. It all started with a full body shiver, my heart worn out from constant labor, a whole country away from what it needed, my brain commandeering the wheel. Sometimes my mind has a mind of its own and not just a road, it created a universe, magic waiting in every corner of my world, an underdeveloped and overacted rom-com brought to life. It was all much too good to be true, but I had no reason to believe otherwise. I had no working definition for manic delusion, nor had I seen the new cracks these new cracks didn't feel like cracks at all they felt like healing they felt like nothing could ever hurt me again like distance too was a construct and what is a construct in the face of limitless love I wanted to share what I had seen with everyone most especially him so I did but he could not see it why couldn't he see it the cracks kept shifting as cracks are wont to do, and just as suddenly as my world became brilliant, lighting changed, pain returned with double the force, distance spread like a weed, my brain whispering, what have I done? It started with checking into the psych ward, fill out these forms as if I was capable of reading, strip down so we can inspect you for bruises, self-inflicted or otherwise. Have you taken any recreational drugs recently? When was the last time you ate? Here's some orange juice. It started with a diagnosis. 10 days of pacing hallways, timid visitors, 10 days, 10 days of zombifying drugs, time smoke breaks, 10 minutes of sunshine if we are lucky. I did not know what psychotic break meant. I just knew it scared me. Piteous looks, sideways glances, no longer for me, but about me. Bipolar is less scary than schizophrenia, right? Started with a notebook. 
hospital issue, making sense, not making any sense, cross-legged on the couch at the end of the hall, this pen, my only reprieve from the endless creep of each passing minute, writing things the doctors didn't want to hear, things I didn't want to say, line by line, excavating the cracks, the truth will set you free, literally, I hope something was churning and then settling and back again inside me. Is this what opening feels like? What healing feels like? What dying feels like? What moving forward feels like? Is this something? It started with my release. I described how I felt as twitchy and delicate when I could find words, but what I really meant was my being is rearranging itself in real time and I have to stand watch so it doesn't get all fucked up. This life I fell in love with revealed to be a mirage, the world as it looked, suddenly flat. I didn't talk to him anymore, or rather, he didn't talk to me, with my mind's universe disintegrating, my heart's road with it. All I had was distance and a notebook. What was true then is true now. I'm not terribly good at distance or distance is not terribly good for me. It's siren call takes me when I have no will at all. Makeshift prison disguised as safe harbor without will. The way is a way. But now neurochemical jailbreak. I am back. I had gone away, but I am finally here. Arrived at the doorstep of my shimmering fate and I grab a handful of dead leaves, my fate has gone, leaving no footprints and taking no pictures, so I draw it from memory, which takes a long time, but it's okay, because I remember everything. I remember realizing I had bitten my left ring fingernail to the nub, how uncomfortable my subconscious made me. I remember dancing around my bedroom after our friendship ended immediately ready for what I was sure would come next. I remember the last time he called me homegirl. I remember when he told me he loved me then pretended he didn't. I remember how many times I had to be told this is not about him before I would listen how when I finally did, it didn't change anything at all. If I keep starting the story, I never have to think about how it might end. One beginning bleeds into another, lessons learned or not, cycles as comforting as they are vicious. I can continue to make the same mistakes, find myself in the same predicaments, the same hospitals, the same pain. I search before the beginning. I thought this mask would hold for far longer. I thought sadness was naivete. Why didn't I allow myself sadness? I search anywhere but the end because my psychiatrist says she doesn't have a crystal ball as if I was expecting her to, as if what I am now requires the kind of foresight reserved for witches. I keep starting the story. I do not have to move beyond it. Beginnings do not require a crystal ball. Write what you know, they say. All I know is the beginning. I am only ever beginning. I keep going back to the beginning. And when I do... I am beginning to move the starting line myself, a game of inches. I am beginning to make some sense filling cracks with gold or at least not ash. My definition of self-care goes beyond face masks and bubble baths because the strain is now the work itself and beginning again once a frustrating mess is a blessing. The odds are not in my favor. Odds that would paralyze my mother if she had the stomach to read them, but the odds, I think, reflect those who look at cracks and see endings. A life or death Rorschach test, I cannot tell you I will always pass. For now, all I see are beginnings. I admit it frustrates me sometimes. I do not have a crystal ball, but I do have this pen and page and an urgent need to use them. Isn't that how all of this started? <laughs> okay, so that was that one. Um, yeah, that one felt really cathartic to write, I have to say. Um, and it was really cool. I, just my, my poetry career, my nascent poetry career, um, has been really illuminating and, uh, you know, well-worn territory is suddenly um, shown in a new light. Um, 
So that's been really cool. Um, the book itself is divided into three sections, uh, mind, body, and heart. And that was from the first section, mind. And I'm going to read from the body section uh, next. This is a piece called Bad Circulation. <clears throat> Sometimes the tips of my fingers are so cold, touch screens do not respond to them. This makes my brain feel funny, failing a real life CAPTCHA challenge. I am alive. I think I just have bad circulation. I have bad circulation, but I am never cold. Heat emanates from my body like the clanking, sputtering radiator in my bedroom, temperamental and out of my control. My body is always warm, but this warmth rarely reaches my fingers or toes. My body is greedy like that. It cannot risk losing a single degree and all my extremities want to do is give it all away. The soles of my feet pound the pavement like punishment, like get me where I'm going and I will give you something to lay out for. My feet point and flex and detect my center of gravity on hard wood lined with mirrors and ballet bars. They prefer to touch it without cotton interference, but my icy toes would be happier if they could feel the floor just a bit more. The tips of my fingers have more delicate sensibilities, the gentle gingerly touch of a hand that does not know what to do with itself, that does not know who would want the shock of fingers that feel dead, seeming to kill whatever they touch. I used to think I typed so hard from years of piano lessons, pressing keys with purpose. Now I wonder if it's my fingers way of generating heat, pumping blood into themselves and those keys. Bots can't write poetry, dead hands don't speak. Each day is an exercise in bringing them to life. The curse of my body's greed revealed to be a test of will, gift of the fight. What my extremities lack in warmth, they make up for in relentless determination. My circulation is bad, but nothing good comes easy. Hmm. Okay, that's that one. Um, okay, we're going to move into the third section, heart, which um, it took me a while to get into the hap into the rhythm of like writing about love, um, because it is a very complicated and fraught topic for me. Um, but there's also been healing in there too. So um, this piece is called Pedestal. This is not a love song. This is an architect's lament, flaming torch primer for my love. My love is not easy. My love is a moving target. My love is underused and overexcited, casually abused, habitually uninvited. It is no mystery why it created this pedestal. This pedestal is made of what I am made of, idle wishes and potential energy. So enamored with what could have been, I forget it was not. The height of this pedestal matches the breadth of my unworthiness. Anyone would rather be up there. Impossible to see wobble in my adoration without seeing wobble in myself. To see that putting them up there means they cannot touch me, cannot love me, but they can still hurt me. It has been so long since I tried without this pedestal, since anyone saw this. I do not know what is in there anymore. It has been even longer since they saw it without stamping it out like a still lit cigarette. I have been a disposable drug for more men than I care to count. Forgive me if I no longer jump at the chance to be refuse. Forgive me if my bullshit detector is a bit sensitive. I am usually quietly right. I spend 20 minutes fretting over which bra to wear while he jerks it to his own reflection. Congratulations on how powerful you are up in those lofty heights where I put you. What he does not know is I do not give a shit about power. Power is boring, tedious. My pedestal is not about power. I just need them close but far enough that they cannot see me. 
My pedestal is my teetering fortress, my defense against those who would snuff me out mid-stride. I do not sing love songs to the heavens. I do not plead with the gods to bring my love to me. I use those heights to steal myself for the fall I created in the first place. Do not think. I do not see the irony. But I am almost out of stone almost out of potential energy, almost ready to not want to feel so small. I am almost ready to bring this pedestal to its knees to see what a person on top of it is made of. My wishes now have movement, and I must believe it is not too late to chisel this rubble into an offering to rediscover my own heart. I might be, maybe, almost ready to fall myself. Um, as you might guess, most of this, most of my poetry was first written to be spoken. Um, that's kind of where I come into it. I, I, to kind of echo something Patty said, um, I write the way I wish I could speak. Um, and so the the process of turning spoken pieces into, you know, proper written published pieces um, was really illuminating. And and thank you to Marissa for for shepherding that process so beautifully. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, well, you're sitting right at 15 minutes, but if you want to close with like uh, maybe where people can find you, yeah, where they sure. can book, how they can follow you, all that good stuff. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Steph Makes Faces, also on Medium, um, Steph Makes Faces. Uh, da, 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 da. I will post the link to buy my book in the chat. Um stephanieislervance.com if you're if you <laughs> if you really want to i'm i'm I, my website needs some work <laughs> let's just put it that way um and thank you for thank you marissa for holding this space and thank you to all the poets here i am continually in awe of all of you thank you Awesome, y'all. Unmute your mics. Please give it up for our second push card nominated poet, Stephanie Eisler Vance. <laughs> oh, man. Like, yeah, the party's not stopping. I mean, now you kind of get a taste. The reason why uh, these individuals were uh, nominated for, uh, for, for the push card prize this year, <coughs> excuse me, this year. <coughs> I firmly believe that God has his hand on, on where we're going and the people who are coming in contact with us uh, and Steph and Christy and uh, all of the IG poets, you know, Kimberly, Maureen, they're all poets who I met just because I took word is right onto IG. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you just open opportunity, um, you know, God will deliver when we're ready. All right, so we're going to draw. Uh, and just so y'all know, I have a very long list of poets for 2023. Uh, so it's not stopping, right? The foundation y'all are laying is uh, is going to be continued um, in, in the future, all right, for next year. And the next poet is Maureen. All right. So uh, here we go. I, I'm so excited. I got to meet this, this woman at the New York City Poetry Festival. She flew all the way in from Portugal. Y'all like it's real. Uh, beautiful cover art. Uh, Shane Maynard did the cover. Um, oh, Maureen has really changed my life. In, in, I mean, all of the poets have changed my life, but um, her book and the concept behind her book um, is, is not like anything else I've ever read anywhere in the world. She makes me question my fundamental viewpoint of, for my own life in association with how I live my life, um, my choices, my choices in, in the food that I eat, uh, the environment that I live in, the, the people that I include in my life. And so it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly um, raw, emotional book. Uh, that will leave you as as changed as, as it has left me. Uh, and I'm blessed and honored and humbled to um, 
have published her book. Uh, so yes, here we go. The first time Maureen performed at an open mic, she was fulfilling a promise to herself to do something that terrified her. How many of you can relate to that, right? Though she had written here and there since she was in her early teens, Maureen's first time performing was with the Queen's poet, Poetic Alchemy Conservative in 2017. She continued to write poetry, but her focus shifted to other forms of activism for the next few years. Devoting herself to learning about and dismantling systemic oppression of all beings, Maureen found inspiration in both hope and devastation. When the pandemic hit, Maureen reconnected with QPAC and attended their virtual open mics regularly. This became a release as she, as she decidedly began her journey of healing and self-discovery. Maureen's work has been featured on Waxy and Poetic Harness Magazine, Independent Media Institute, The Well World, and she has her own blog. And she also has a show here at The Word is Right. One of her favorite pieces, These Hands, was published in Grassroots Theater Company's Winter Zine and featured as Cafe Writer's Poem of the Month from February to April of 2022. Maureen is the founder of Leave in Peace, an initiative focused on assisting and highlighting the reality of slaughterhouse workers, she has organized food and clothing drives since before the pandemic and has helped distribute over 1,500 meals and over 1,000 pounds of clothing, shoes, and toiletries. To support her, visit her link tree, leave in We lost you. You're muted now? Marissa, we can't hear you. Are, are can you, you muted us? now, Marissa? Marissa. Marissa, we can't we, hear you. We cannot hear you. Marissa, can you hear us? Marissa, we cannot hear we you, Marissa. Hear you. What happened? We can't hear you. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. Oh my goodness, my internet must be in and out. If that happens again, please stop me and let me know. Uh, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, to, to support my work. Okay. Maureen is a campaign organizer for Slaughter Free New York City, which aims to shut down slaughterhouses in New York City and, um, for the benefit of communities that are directly exposed to them, as well as the non-human animals that are destroyed in them. Maureen advocates for both human and non-human animals and asserts that all oppression is connected. In alignment with the idea that none of us are free unless all of us are free, Maureen hopes to inspire the pursuit of collective libertarian through her writing. Uh, all right, so uh, let's pick, um, um, Faison is, is great. Uh, this is what Faison Syed said um, about her book. Reading my fears out loud is an experience unlike any other. Mesmerizing, hard-hitting, and terrifyingly beautiful, it strikes home with such brutal honesty and tender vulnerability all at once. Only a true visionary like Maureen could craft a tapestry of truth that spares no one, not even herself. The work as a whole remains unceasingly and fundamentally humane and kind. It is, it is at, excuse me, fundamentally humane and kind in its commitment to truth. Even as she acknowledges the almost unfathomable human capacity for cruelty, greed, narcissism, and ignorance, it opens up a door towards the light of redemption and beckons you towards it. The vision that this book epitomizes finds peace and wisdom in the sanctity of life. All life is equal and transcends the artifice of hierarchy. Maureen's vision is deeply humbling. That is why it's so urgently necessary. Y'all, please unmute your mics. Give it up for our third Pushcart Prize nominated poet, Maureen Medina. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Marissa. Um, look at my hoodie. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> love it, love it. Merch, get your merch going, guys. Let's go. I'm only selling shirts. I wanted to be special and be the only one with a hoodie, but some people um, do have my shirts. Um, so I'm practicing saying this. Uh, my name is Maureen and I'm a published author. I'm practicing saying that. This is my book, everyone. So um, first of all, thank you so much for the nomination. I am so honored to be among so much power and talent. Um, 
and I'm very humbled to witness so like all of you. So thank you. Uh, okay, before I, I may forget this later because I'm already nervous. So as Marissa said, I do host workshops on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. The next workshop is this coming Tuesday, December 13th. And the next one or the last one of the of 2022 is Tuesday, December 27th. So I will leave my link when I'm done. Um, but my website is basically Linktree, linktr.ee slash Maureen P. Medina. And there you can uh, find all my social media platforms. You can order my book and leave a review for my book, please. And as Marissa said, if you haven't read my book, please do. But also if, if you have heard my work and it resonates with you, please leave a review anyway. So um, I just wanna start by saying that I, I actually always preface like everything by saying that I'm terrified, hence my title, My Fears Out Loud. And people ask me like, why, why do you always say that you're scared? And um, I found that it has not only been saving a saving grace for myself, it's also seems to have um, helped others. I've attended multiple workshops and other life events. And I've, you know, been honest about how scared I am like literally of everything, I'm scared of everything. And people have done things or they've performed for the first time or they've just put themselves out there and they have messaged me saying, you know, it, it has really helped to know that someone else was afraid and they did it anyway. So I'm gonna keep on saying that I'm scared because fuck it, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm a scaredy cat, but I'm a brave scaredy cat because I do the shit anyway. And so the second thing I wanna say is today is International Animal Rights Day. Now, I did leave a post earlier, and, and obviously not everyone is connected, but something I'm always asked is, why do you care about animals and not humans? To my first answer is always, we are all animals, and all oppression is connected. And so the way I arranged my book is in three sections. The first the first section is about self-discovery and acceptance, and the second one is about generational um and inherited trauma and then the third one is about the isms anthropocentrism which is human supremacy racism sexism able you know the isms and so i felt like i had to earn the credibility of anyone who witnesses me anyone who reads my book that i do care about multiple social justice issues which we all should um but so as not to be cast off right away, I put the non-human animal related stuff content last, last but not least, right? But I'm gonna end with that stuff, but for, for now I'm gonna go through my book. Um, part of my fear is always choosing the pieces that I think are the best, but I have a whole book and they're all the best. So please put in the chat, any number between 4 to 17, any number between 19 to 42, and any number between 53 to 92. I'm going to leave it up to you. And I'm terrified about that. <laughs> okay. 11. I see you. Let me come, oh, excuse me. I see you inspired by Pat Parker's piece, Let Me Come to You Naked. <clears throat> Let me come to you naked, fearful. My heart pounding out of my chest, so much so that I seem transparent. Let me be vulnerable as I stagger toward healing. How I wish I was strong enough to accept my bravery. Apologetic to myself, yet so unforgiving, unrelenting. I deserve better from myself. That'll show you, I mean me, I mean us, how I should be treated. Let me come to you naked, belly up. Let me introduce my parts, all the pieces that clumsily try to fit together. Let me assume the faces that I have created, not out of survival, but out of craving. Oh, how I long to be me entirely, 
how I long to know who that would be, what I would look like if I was bold enough to peer at the mirror held up for me to see. I am more than meets the eye, and as I dare to look up at, at myself, I say out loud, I see you. I see you. How's that piece? All right, let's see what else we got here. Okay. This one is about my dad. It's called Toast. Bread and butter, the crunch, the flavor, remind me of you. When you'd pick me up from school, make me toast, slathered in butter and coated it with sugar. When you'd braid my hair, mom still hasn't learned how. When you'd get dressed up, slick your hair back, and wear your Montagut shirts, which I still can't pronounce. I just know the Filipino mispronunciation. I just know you had all the colors. Toast reminds me of how you accessorize, adorned in gold, obnoxious and endearing. Toast reminds me of gargoyles, mummies alive, swimming pools in the summer, Hercules, Xena, the warrior princess, naps, shoelaces, German shepherds and Yorkies, poker, the multiplication table, card games, blueberries, jasmines. Toast reminds me that I wish I had more time with you, with this least wounded version of you. Toast reminds me of your smile your laughter, your serenades. Please don't think I forgot. I remember everything. Okay, let me see. Okay, that's a long one. Let me see a second here. Okay, this is called Change and it's about my sister. You tell me what excites you. You tell me what's new, haircut, shoes, bikinis. You tell me you miss me, ask why I don't say it back. It's not that I don't, or maybe it is. I want to miss you, but when I think of you, I think of why I left. I think about all of you and how I still haven't learned to separate you from them or me from you. So I can't say that I miss you because it's too early to know for certain where you end and where I begin. When I think about home, I do think of you, how I always dreamed of leaving. And then I wonder, don't you ever want more? Why have you never left? As I pause to reflect and gather some compassion for the weight that wasn't yours to bear, your inheritance, mine. I know it's not all your fault for resisting change when that's all you knew. All right, let's see about here. Okay. What the hell? Okay. Blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. You use it against me, grasping at straws, a last ditch effort to bring me back into the fold. Blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. You carried me and delivered me into this world. Though I know love, though I have been nurtured, though you know what makes me laugh, our familiarity ended when I lost my innocence. If only you knew what made me weep, what keeps me up at night, what makes it impossible for me to exist in this world. If only you knew what hurt me most, the very thing that keeps me going. As my eyes opened and I chose to see, it was then I found my chosen family, raging against violence, begging for peace. We chose this life and in turn chose each other. My sisters, we shared a womb, we share the same black hair, the same mannerisms, and even the same last name. But my covenant, my people, 
They don't know the stories of my youth, but they have plunged into the darkness with me as we searched for light together. Yes, mom, you bore me. And as I fled your body and your feminine, I landed on uncharted territory delivered right into the front lines with warriors. They bleed with me. They mourn with me. They know me. They are me. <clears throat> the next one is called Harlem, inspired by Langston Hughes Harlem. In white America, where your dreams are deferred, we don't care if you're black, but it's not preferred. Where they dry up, I can't breathe, put your hands up, I can't breathe. Raisins in the sun, but not too much sun. Racism kills our black sons. All moms were summoned when he called for just one. They fester like sores. Protesters, protesters, test the crowd, make them go wild. Don't run or they'll shoot. Tear gas, blind the masses, anti-racist, anti-fascist. And hate stinks like rotten meat. Like the 13th Amendment, a claim to end slavery, but always read the fine print, mass incarceration, black criminalization. And if you speak up, there goes the First Amendment, until they crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. He incites violence with nonsensical tweets, justice for all, land of the free. Dominate, he says, crush his neck with your knee, inflammatory rhetoric, sanctioned brutality, and hate sags with a heavy load. A weapon of mass destruction, systemic oppression in tow. Your racism is showing America's about to implode. When windows are broken, it's all over the, new the news. But bring on the lynching, Trump ready the noose. Arrest the cops that killed Brianna. Hunt for George Floyd. Four centuries captured in eight minutes, nine minutes. Skin color, yeah, they weaponize it. Silence is violence, so I'll say this out loud. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. And then I lost count here. I lost count of all the numbers. Oh, well, that was a... Um, Ah, okay, I haven't read this one yet. So th this is my attempt at a rap. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. <clears throat> it's called Meet Your Meat. This was actually at a workshop um, by Nick Paleologos. So it's called Meet Your Meat. <clears throat> Meet your meat, it's a meet and greet. You beat your meat as they meet their fate and up on your plate. Meet the guidelines set by the USDA. Meet the oncologist, meet the cardiologist who says eating meat is okay, even when their DNA mutates every time we play God. We swap meat at the swap meat and that meat you can't live without must live without meeting their young. So savory on your tongue, the dung of your meat is why the heat rises. It's a crisis. The climate has met its match. Meet the monsters we name as thieves, though they are neither. We say they take our jobs when instead they take lives and their hands meet as they pray for pardon. Pardon me. There's no meeting halfway. We are past the tipping point. Millions have nothing to eat. Their food is fed to your meat. Land and water loss for your meat. Destruction for as far <clears throat> as the land meets the sea. Trees gone for your meat and soon you'll be struggling to breathe like the meat that you eat. They stick and they meet your organ failure. So much erasure and we blame it on culture. We ravage nature and it's not natural. When we harm one, we harm all. But you never meet your meat until they're packaged nice and neat from their ass to their feet, your afternoon treat. You say it's cheap, more than leafy greens. Soon you'll meet your maker, but first a pacemaker for your ticker, your heart. Meet the flicker, the spark burning down the Amazon. All hands on deck as you slit the neck of the one you'll never meet. Bleed them out. That's what happens for meat, slabs on the grill, fires raging for the kill, ignited by your appetite for meat. Their life ends when your craving begins. If eating meat is personal, shouldn't we ask the individual who we never meet until they become meat? 
I'll meet you at the crossroads to reflect on the true cost of meat instead of asking, you care about pigs, but what about peat? What else can I say? God damn, you love meat. Uh, how much did I pass on? Did I? Over? You're sitting right at 15 minutes. So if you okay. want to kind of tell people where they can find you, follow you, all that good stuff, uh, buy your book. Um, yeah, that was an, that was an incredible closing line, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so again, happy International Animal Rights Day. I hope you really think about that. We are all animals. And uh, please don't eat or wear children. And uh, this is my book, My Fears Out Loud. You can order it. You can read more of my work. You can connect with me on Linktree, linktr.ee slash Maureen P. Medina, and I'll put it on the chat. Thank you so much. Amazing, y'all. Unmute your mics, please. Give it up for our third reader, Maureen Medina. Woohoo! Yes. So good. It's, it's so good, right? Like it's, and it's not That's stopping. Fun. Like we got three more. Like you can't go anywhere. We got three more. Uh, it is not stopping. Uh, just a reminder, poets, please get your books up on Goodreads. If you have not had a chance to do that yet, uh, reach out to me. Let me know. Uh, and let's please give. Uh, if you've had a chance to read her work, read her book, hear her work, uh, please go on to Goodreads and review all of these poets. All right, here we go. Uh, next up to the mic is. I kind of like this, the the drawing of destiny, right? Um, uh, the um, verb bender slam team calls it the drawing of doom. I call it the drawing of destiny. Here we go. Ah, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Sophia Strauss, you are up next. All right, so like I don't have enough time to talk about Lizzie. So um, what she was seeming to give me the 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 pause finger. Uh, so I don't have a lot of. Um, additional time to talk about Lizzie, but I will just say that uh, Elizabeth Sophia Strauss has created an entire new form of poetry called Panku. I'm sure that she will uh, let you know uh, what that is and how that works. Um, I've been honored and humbled to publish her multiple times now. She's also worked diligently on our LGBTQ literary art anthology titled Out Loud. Uh, she, that was her book baby and she put it together. And she also hosts a show uh, here at The Word is Right. So we're super excited to have her in so many facets of the press. So she's also helping to um, compile um, uh, tutorial videos for the future authors here at Red or Green Books. So we're so um, thrilled and honored to have her. All right, this little bit about Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. She is a queer activist, author, <clears throat> educator, MC, producer, publisher, realtor, and stage manager residing in New York. ES is the founder, CEO, and producer of the Broadway Brokers Network and the Broadway Stage Management Symposium, creator of the poetry style Pankus. Zer auto dramas, monologues, and plays include Later Alligator, Title IX, Body Language, Masks Slash Scars, Notoriously Resilient, Tate, The COVID Monologues, This Is My Garden. Known as the spoken word artist deadpan Lizzie the Beanie God, she's been featured with the Norican Poets Cafe and worldwide. A Broadway artist for over a decade, working on several Tony Award winning productions. ES has taught theater studies at NYU, the University of Rhode Island, Deutsch POP in Austria and Germany. <clears throat> Educating through mini series, Zur has created and produced available as podcasts, real estate, theater, and art mini series. University of Rhode Island cum laude. She has also published her third book. Third? third book called Inner Visions, also through Red or Green Books, which we're thrilled to have. Uh, you can find her Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Uh, and then I will do a quick review. She loves um, Elise Versella's um, review, right? Or is it, um, or is it? I, I love Elise and all the reviews. The one that was Oh, you like Elaine because it's in Taku format. <laughs> I love all of them, by the way. I, I do. Elaine I just so inspired to write it as a fan too. All right, so I'll read Elaine Hills because it's in Panku style, which I think like if you're going to review a book and you put it in the style of the book you read, I think that is just that's yeah, she's just amazing. And Elaine Hill is one of the original poets here at Red or Green Books. 
All right. I was stuck. Didn't know it. Now I'm not. I need to forget to stay inside the lines. Deadpan Lizzie ES creates the form Panku to draw her own lines from real estate to nervous breakdowns. She invites us to draw our lines as well. When daily writing bestows importance in everyday things, beanies, injuries, bullies, sex toys, work, wisdom, New York City, cuisine. An entire poem about gaff tape? Yes, there it is. This book is a nine word trail that, be, that brings deadpan humor to light where it writhes then says, Okay, y'all unmute your mics, please give it up for our fourth Pushcar Prize nominated poet, Miss Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Woo -woo -woo -woo! Go, 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 go. Thank you, Beanie Blessings. Um, it is an incredible honor uh, to be nominated for Pushcart with these five uh, people I call my friends and um, fellow published author. So congratulations to all of us and every single reviewer, not just Elaine and Elias, but everyone. Um, and to those who felt inspired to write it as a pan who um, touched my heart immensely. So thank you. And Marissa and Shane, Grill Poets and Writer Green Books and Warriors Write for uh, just believing in us because Kundubini was not in the plans at all. Uh, Inner Visions, which Marissa mentioned is my third book out right now. Uh, with Telltale Poetry and Green Books was actually the first manuscript in poetry collection of proses. Um, and then we, I had a brainchild to do out loud. I wanted my LGBTQ community to shine. So we, I said, I want to curate and edit an anthology. And we did that. And then I had another manuscript that'll come out next year. And Marissa said, oh, I'm putting out a law, another launch. And I said, oh, that's cool. <laughs> As we were on an editing call, for, um, out loud actually and she's like yeah you're gonna be the baker's dozen I said nah I, I'm all, like in the middle of having a nervous breakdown and being queer baited and ending our relationship and like my grandmother just died and like the world is just slowly like shitting on me and she's like no 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 Shane and I want you to do it and I said I don't even know what I would write <laughs> my mind was just so dry and I had created Panku's almost a uh, year now on uh, New Year's Eve last year and just nine words and I'm sure one day I would have made it a book and make, and branched it out into other styles but never thought it would happen this quickly and you know Marissa and Shane were very much my cheerleaders and, said, and just like figure something out and I said I don't know a book of pankus and they're like yeah here's your contract and so um while I was having a nervous breakdown, because that's what this is, it's the diary of a nervous breakdown. Um, I created three new styles of poetry, pantsuits for my spoken word game. Um, and I'm very proud of the book. Um, I'm completely unapologetic about the book because I wrote this as healing for me. Um, I'm someone that, like, I, I don't care if people like my spoken word. I don't care if people like my books. I mean, that's nice and it's wonderful and I hope it helps other people heal, but I wrote it for me. So, you know, I'm unapologetic about life. I'm gonna be unapologetic about my art. Um, and if people are confused about this, it's because they're not taking the time to work on themselves. Um, isn't that just the deadpan truth? You know, if you don't wanna understand something, you're not taking the time to just work on your own self. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read a, one of each form from the book. Um, and thank you for reading my bio and Elaine's review so beautifully, Marissa, and for everything you do for our community. So as I said, there are three forms. The first form is just nine word poems. It's not like a haiku, it's not syllables, it's any nine words, okay? Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Um, the first one is the nine word poem and uh, it's called Iceberg. I am the iceberg floating frigidly, tired, hard, unsure. That's a nine word Cantu. So as you know, I was having my breakdown and putting this book together. I just felt like I had to keep writing. I created a nine by nine Cantu. Um, I'm gonna read, I don't read this one that much, but um, I'm going to read it today. It's called The Dysfunctional Partner. And all the poetry of Pankus are dated in um, 
in the books is a diary. So it's from February 17th of this year. I want to find a partner who understands me. Limits of needing space and needing them, but never 24 seven, or I fear the connection will fizzle out faster than flat soda. But do I long for the balance of a healthful, sexual, cerebral, and emotional relationship that I desire and feel I, that I am ready and need that again, where I won't feel threatened, frozen, or hit capacity to love them. I hope I find them and I hope happily. And um, next I will um, read, this is the first epic pan poo ever created also on February 17th. Um, so it's nine lines, nine words each, nine stanzas. So it's 729 words. And that's what's called nine stanzas, lines, and pan poos. I used to believe everything that came into my possession was the most important in my three decades around the earth and the rest of the solar system, my soul gravitates slowly and sometimes too quickly. For me to catch my rather shallow breath, these weary days living in the still New York state of mind, James Taylor and not Billy Joel underscores me. In this pan food, a poetry that is not a trick of trivia, but I will write promptly, deciphering my thoughts. Messy, I will always be a stage manager's penmanship. I go down the list of prompts from my twisted twin who gave them out. The moon shined through all of our eyes watching the dark Long Island sound from my grandparents' 20th century. What I think is teal or used to be rather comfortable couch that I could rest on for a good long while, typing away my thoughts on my slightly dusty Mac hair. Well, I've written the good, bad, sad, angry, positive truths about my life and many others as we continue to transition into another year where mine feels slightly more challenging than others, though I know theirs are just as hard sometimes, but perhaps they put on a better poker face than I. But why put on a face that we cannot read a vibe that makes many shake in their non teal booty still shining? Like gorillas, we attach our hands like bananas, our safety food full of potassium to keep us thriving. So we do not lose energy on our journey for how long we last on planet Earth. We bumble around figuring out our next move. Or should I say move, speaking for myself, given I seem to stop like fruits and vegetables once I become too raw to digest or rotten to live, existing not living in the frigid fridge of the world. New York City, the freezer that I finally escaped became freezer burnt instead of helpful and edible letting myself defrost on the teal couch by the sea, sort of catching my breath again and again, letting the same tunes I've heard through my playlist and on the radio rattle me. Do I wish on the radio by Goddess Donna Summer would play on repeat, my safety net for the monkeys fucking around with us, hanging from their trees. For too long, I feel like I'm existing and not living, but some days are rich and you cannot help but live flowing like liquid fluid until it becomes time to evaporate back into your perfect Upper East Side apartment where you feel safe and are content not living on the outside and existing on the inside, of feeling happier safe in my new space, cold and dreary with no midnight in sight, like tofu frozen in my new icebox, gross and bland. But unlike the tofu not saturated in teriyaki sauce or any tasty marinade to spice up my life, I turned back to comfort food to catch up and hopefully able to figure out what comes next. Will be curries from London, India, or Bangladesh, or cuisines I have not discovered yet from nations, nowhere on my radar where the sun shines bright, or on my body and thoughts to feel okay in the toxic world that gets you to slip on, the banana peels that gorillas litter without thinking about the harm they may cause the rest of us, that we cannot rid we are too inside our heads and bodies to let the peace be. We let the saturation of the earth make us feel a soggy warm that takes us too long to rid ourselves, where we get to a point where we let the stenches and spices become us, and not for the better, almost sour like the grapes in the bottom of the new sub-zero that have not become moldy as we pull ourselves out of the mindset. I will pull myself out of this mindset or does that not stick that does not stick at the bottom of the frying pan or in the tinfoil that has burnt onto the black baking pan, hoping to taste good on our twisted tongues for dinner. 
And again, for breakfast, brunch, dinner, dinner, each small snack and meal in between, making a feasting on our words. Um, and that actually were five prompts that I made my own from Nick Pale logos. Um, and you can get his book, The Red Green Books, Adverses Reaction. Um, Marissa, how much more time do I have? Uh, you have like uh, seven minutes. Oh, okay. Um, no, wait, sorry. Can we choose? Like you have 12 minutes. I can't count. I can publish books, but like math's not my strong suit. So no, I'm just okay. kidding. I'll you read can. a couple. Thank you. I'll read a couple more then. Um, this poem is from March 2nd. It's untitled. It's a nine by nine fan suit. I'm a Jewish woman, proud of my culture, religion, identity. Who bleeds white and blue from the Dead Sea past the East River and back to Long Island Sound. Who continues to watch her heritage die in Ukraine. Who learned recently her family perished in the Holocaust and worries as she watches those being murdered in the same fields again. What will happen next? It is sobering to learn parts of my family lost their lives at war again. And I'll leave you all with one more. It's the second epic Cancun in the book. Actually, my favorite one in the book. It's a long day's journey or a lifetime I create. It's from March 4th. Sitting in my own pain and sorrow, wishing I was not surprised by the crap that was thrown in my face as I walked the brisk streets of the concrete jungle I need a break from, in hope of one more commission before I take a long hiatus from renting apartments and transition to luxury sales. Owning, I'm a power broker, regardless of what the other poets say. To not understand if they grab them like hard, if they're giving an unwanted hand job, sitting here listening to nothing because I'm bored of my own playlist as backdoor covers run through my mind. Sipping on lime seltzer because my empty water bottle fell in the subway yesterday. In the wash, I fear I will become more sickly from the jungle shit. Am I rechargeable like batteries or am I on a road to expiring like almond milk? in my kiki fridge, like my friendship with the person who named my refrigerator. I think of this friend and all I hear static music. What used to make my heart flutter now makes my stomach turn like pasta boiling on my shitty rent controlled Upper West Side apartment, wishing they'd stop. Covering the infanticized love, thinking about my life as I transition from one side of the park to the other, I, I suffered what must, most would say is a severe nervous breakdown. I do not know why I sat in a not as great as I thought it would be glass shower in the freezing cold two-bedroom apartment, letting the water run over my naked body and fragile mind. Why did I sit on the floor for minutes? Why did I need to do this? Was I simply copying what I had seen in movies? Did it help? Not really. Did I guide myself to a safer space? Yes. Did I make the right decision leaving? Part-time suburban versus the other times in the city? I think so. Only time will tell. The day the country won as I dragged myself back to what some would say posh flat. As I went home with no commission in fear, I bounced from rental check to sales commission and hopped from island to island. If the management will come through, one small $1,000 is no small fee, and one I am owed. Walking through cold down under the Manhattan-Brooklyn Bridge this late morning and early afternoon, I remembered why I love Brooklyn and Dumbo, the neighborhood, not the film. It is gorgeous and showcases my favorite blue blanket, the East River. I glided past the water and looked up at the historic piece of New York. I was not able to figure out until I got back to the train how to walk on it. Disappointing like a check that has not been written. When you rent real estate, you rent my time too. But this is the risk realtors take walking through the post-day blizzard, Manhattan snow in order to close a deal, terrorizing my mind like the ride in MGM Studios, Disney World, the elevator bumps me up to headquarters, the carpet as well, the accountant's office. My sword has been stuck all 2022. All 30 years of my life in the stone. Like Arthur, I cannot pull it out. But when will the sword finally give me some wriggle room? Is it when I die? Is this too morbid a prose? Am I allowed to be upset, disappointed, frustrated, scared, unhappy? Am I allowed to be happy ever? Sitting on my maternal grandparents' floating couch, period cramps hate on my body and mind as I finish this pamphlet. 
No ibuprofen able to relieve my pain. Day two of my cycle, the cramps another day on my journey to pain, never leaving. The stronger, stronger than day one, I cannot remember the last time I had powerful period cramps on the second full day of my cycle. I hope on day three they subside because I need to catch a break. I believe I do deserve one, do you? The skyscrapers closed in on me and I let them half win my journey through life, not dancing. Or perhaps tomorrow night. But will I choreograph a dance again when the time feels right? So that's just a few from Kundalini. I'm incredibly proud of this book. Um, as I look back on the last year, really almost year of my life, um, I can't believe I did it. And I just want to thank Martha and Shane for seeing that I had another vision to put out in the world because I was very scared because um, of everything that was going on and the abuse going on. I was abuse going on in my life. So, um, you know, just don't be afraid to challenge yourself and put it out there. And if people don't get it, it's okay. Um, you know, we don't, we don't do this to get nominated for prizes. We don't do this, um, you know, for accolades and stuff. And it's nice and it's, it's wonderful. And I hope it inspires other people. But um, we do this to heal through the pain and abuse and the trauma that um, a lot of us sadly have to suffer living here. So um, thank you. All right, Lizzie, where can people find you, follow you, get your book, all that good stuff? What you got coming up? My, my heat just turned on, so I hope you can hear me. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Um, um, you can find me on IG, ES underscore Strauss, and um, my website, uh, ElizabethSophiaStrauss.com. All right, y'all, unmute your mics, please give it up for our fifth, excuse me, fourth, see math, our fourth Pushcart Prize nominated poet, Miss Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Thank you. Woo! Let's Woo! go. <laughs> right, Thank you very so much. I, I think that like fear uh, or terror is like Maureen said, I'm terrified, right? Uh, fear and terror is something that we all share as uh, publishing debut authors. So, um, but do what Ma Maureen said, I'm brave. I'm a brave scaredy cat. And then Lizzie says, if people don't get it, it's okay, right? I mean, these are these are uh, nuggets of, of intelligence from experience that these, um, that these authors are giving today. So, and it's totally true what, what Lizzie said when she first came up here, when she had the idea to do out loud, she approached me and she said, I'd love to do a, a queer anthology uh, with only queer authors. And I'm like, okay, let's go. If you have an idea that you would like to bring to Red or Green Books, please just reach out, right? Uh, it, what it, it was, um, Patty says, uh, I accept rejection, right? But the, the answer is no, unless you ask. So if you don't ask me, I can't possibly say yes and I can't possibly move mountains to make things happen. So please, please, please just ask. Yeah, if I, I can... just wanna say one, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. About, cause Patty and I like, all I did is walk into Stonewall Bar and ask if they would put my books in there and they said yes. Right. So my books now sit in one of the most famous LGBTQ bars in the world. So don't be afraid. They might say no, but no is a full sentence, right? So, exactly yeah. exactly right uh it, it doesn't if they say no it's fine go to the next go to the next go to the next because you never know where that person's going to be who picks up your book and reads it right and just a reminder please go to goodreads uh give these um authors five star reviews if you've not been to the website yet please do red or green red is r-e-a-d the links to their social medias are there their bios the reviews all of that good stuff all right next up here we go two more to go we got the urban cowboy poet and kimberly cam anderson let's see who is going to read next and who is going to wrap us up tonight today tonight if you're maureen or kimberly all right we got kimberly cammy anderson uh that means greg you are going to finish us off uh in just a bit all right so um how the hell do i explain this woman like I, it's like lizzie i don't have enough time to do that here. Um, I met Kimberly by chance on Instagram, right? And I say by chance, because unless you do something outside your comfort zone, you can't possibly meet people like her. And she, I, I say this about, about her, sometimes I think she blushes, like uh, she, she doesn't feel yet that she deserves the accolades, but she does. She read the best poem that I heard in 2021. 
hands down. I met her at the end of 2021. She read the best poem. It brought me to tears. And in fact, it's in this book. Um, and, and I was like, we need to, you need to have a book. Like, like you just, if I don't do it, just get someone to do it because you are too important um, as are all of you, but particularly uh, this, this author and, and what she writes about, it just, it needed to go to print. It had to, uh, and it was like a mission. And, and I reached out to her and I said, would you like to publish a book? And I think like um, Stephanie or, or Lizzie, they were like, well, I'm not ready or I don't have enough stuff or what, you know, so kind of guiding to this, it's real, like it happens. And this is something no one can ever take away from you guys, okay? <clears throat> so I've, I've been incredibly humbled to learn um, this woman and her story, not just as a woman, but as a mother. Uh, her, her stories continue to bring me to tears. I encourage all of you please to um, get a copy of everyone's books and, and then you'll know what I know, okay? All right, Kimberly Anderson was born in 1992 in Durban in Zwazulu Natal. And if I say this wrong, I always apologize uh, for that. <clears throat> she would only really experience life once. Her mother relocated back to her hometown, Ishoe. Oh, I don't I, Okay, good. A very small farming town in Zulululand. And this is in South Africa. Uh, Kimberly grew up as a colored or mixed race girl, which was not something that she saw as a barrier or a challenge. It was only when she became a teenager and dated a black guy in the township, which seemed to offend a few people so much. So he was threatened by people of her race and offered money to leave her by his. The relationship continued in like some young romance that eventually did come to an end. Growing up, she became more aware of people's perception of what colored or mixed race people were perceived as and continued to shock people when she did not tick the boxes as to what or how a colored female was or should behave. In 2029, she began to write poetry, but not until 2017 did she use poetry as an outlet when going through depression and anxiety. <clears throat> And excuse me, in December 2017, she re relocated with her family to Johannesburg, uh, also known as Josie. It is there where she found the love of poetry so much more. Kimberly wrote about her experiences of not being colored enough because of her not speaking Afrikaans, but speaking Zulu instead. She wrote about the challenges of growing up in a single parent household and used her love for history as one of the foundations that birthed many pieces, such as the labor pains of Africa and the forgotten. Her motto is, my name might be forgotten, but my teachings continue to live on so history is never repeated. Kimberly continues to live by it through every poem. I'm gonna read you Diane Ward's uh, review of her book, uh, Diane was here uh, a bit earlier. This is Diane Murray Wards. If you want to know what we're reading, read this. If you can manage real time truths, pick this up. If you want to remain in denial, still buy this book. If you think this might be banned and therefore worthy enough to leave in your will, consider this an investment. So much her story repeats itself. Ms. Anderson is a South African poet describing the beautifully ge ge gene genetically mosaic, excuse me. Ms. Anderson is a South African poet describing the beautifully genetically mosaic us, ignorantly maligned and marginalized in many places worldwide. Why do some fear the brilliant, the bright personifications of rainbows? Assess your merit, your bias, your vision and labeling. Ms. Anderson reveals her life and others within the book, this book of truths. Be advised, this is a quote laden book. For some, their lessons are just beginning and this firsthand resource will aid them if they dare to journey with her. Y'all unmute your mics, please give it up for our fifth Pushcar Prize nominated poet, Ms. Kimberly Anderson. Woo -hoo -hoo! Woo, Kimberly. Uh, And it's 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 late at night. Let's not wake the neighbors. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon. Good evening. Um, 
everyone is it's such an amazing ooh, amazing space with such amazing writers from all over the world yes my face always goes red marissa because we give us some time you know some of us are, are not used to coming out of the box <laughs> we created the the box we sat in the box and we were comfortable in the box um and then we came across people like you that just said no boy we we we're not allowing that to happen and which is absolutely amazing because of the communities we find ourselves in the creative community as well sometimes they're not very accepting of us that are different or have different perspectives on certain things um so yes a, a warm greeting from south africa your pronunciations are getting way better uh Eshawa, you did very well uh kwazulu natal we need to work on that one <laughs> but um with that being said the first piece i'm gonna kick off uh, I'm just going to hop into it because there's a little story behind this first piece, which was birthed about a week ago based on the book. And when I was sharing the book, so uh, this one is entitled, um, I'll blame it on the poetry. <laughs> Maybe it's the poetry that's taken over me. It got me feeling free from who I used to be. Was blind, but now I see. I guess it's the poetry that's taken over me. It got me feeling free from who I used to be. Was blind, but now I see. I blame it on the poetry. See, I've only acknowledged the five-year journey of making peace a priority, but the silence whispers tales of old before my pen birthed bravery to release the cries of molestation hidden in poems like Innocent Blood and Dolly House. I pull the ace, now the curtain is down and you see the hidden scars neatly tucked behind this smile. The wisdom, wisdom found at the edge of my lips came at a price. So eat, make sure to eat the honey that drips from my words slowly for I am and forever will be slow to speak but quick to listen. But when I do, when I do just lend me the soul to your ear, let the words I spew out sink deep into your roots and feed the part of you that longs for nourishment more than a physical touch. I learned, <laughs> I learned that fear that I learned that F stands for freedom found after forgiveness. E is everlasting love and eternal life. A, I will acknowledge and accept the consequences of my actions. R, I'm going to remind myself that fear will never rule over me again. Fear will never, ever rule over me again. Maybe, maybe it's just me. But I honestly think that poetry is a woman. Just listen to what I have to say. I think she's a woman um, because she or he or it, it will never allow me to go through anger without a dramatic reaction. Even if the words, you see, the words will never find their way off each page and into my mouth. But she she forces me and she forces my hand from left to right to right just so we can release how we feel. <laughs> because even if you... Even if we never told you to your face, sometimes, just sometimes, you are such an ignorant idiot. That really felt good to actually say out loud. I say this with a smile. Even though my hands are trembling as I recite this piece because I guess I'm not ready or I'm not done releasing the anger within. So here we go again. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Yes, you said my English was very advanced. What exactly did you mean by that? Um, I said those words internally because I found it hard to find the words at the tip of my tongue. Even though rage surfaced within, I really wanted to allow the violent colored chick act to take the wheel and be everything that my community says I am with a beer in hand. <laughs> but I allowed the piece found in poetry to remind me of who I am, who I really am and of my history. So yes, 
I am that color chick. And yes, I am African. And yes, I speak good English, contrary to what you may think. And I apologize. I apologize if I, I didn't fit the shoe of African poverty and illiteracy that you may have been sold. And contrary to what you may think, uh, you actually thrive only because of the land I walk so boldly on. And yes, one more thing. We will continue to master the tongue forced upon us. For this is the art. This is the only art of breaking the back of a giant. So I'll continue to... <laughs> Maybe it's the poetry that's taken over me. It got me feeling free from who I used to be. Was blind, but now I see. I'm going to blame it on the poetry. Uh, so that was that piece. Um, <laughs> that piece... I was in a space on Clubhouse because I, I so I love Clubhouse because uh, I don't have to put my camera on <laughs> um, and I can just listen to it like it's a radio station. That's what I like to think of Clubhouse as. Um, and I was just vibing out with some some poets and sharing. And there was a poet uh, I allowed into our space. And it's very unfortunate that we still have uh, so much of a level of ignorance when it comes to different countries and the disrespect. Uh, the ignorant disrespect that we show towards other people. And uh, this was a, a, a poet from Europe, and I was sharing a piece uh, from the book, Marissa's favorite piece, which, which was The Labor Pains of Africa. And this was a, a, a last month, and I could only write the piece about a few weeks ago because uh, I couldn't find the right words. And she says to me, your English is very advanced. Uh, for those that don't believe the story, I screenshotted the conversation, even though I removed her name. It's on my IG feed. And uh, um, because some people didn't believe that I still go through this, that I still have people say, wow, you, have, you speak good English or your English is very advanced. Um, yes, we have universities in Africa. <laughs> uh, and yes, there's a lot of things that need to be changed when it comes to people's misconceptions, which is why this book is here. This book is not, was not just for me um, and to share the journey of my identity, but also changing how people think. So with that being said, let me just go in and I'm gonna read the first piece, which is the very first piece on my book, which basically goes back to where I come from. Um, if I am no more, Remember me in the silence. How would soothe my soul and birth poetry, words of motivation and tranquility. But if you truly wish to seek for a glimpse of me, I, I will be found in the laughter of my daughters, my warmth in every hug, my teachings on the way they treat others and my character in the way they carry themselves. But if you seek for more, or want to know more of who or what I was, my journey of turning pain into power will reveal the hidden truth if read closely between the lines. Um, and that was that piece. It's very short. I think it's the shortest piece I've ever written. And um, with that, one of the key pieces with finding my identity was I was afraid of me. I was once afraid of shadows, the ones that lurked in the corners of my room, then slowly seeped their way into my mind. They brought whispers, the kind that had me questioning my own sanity. I was once afraid of mirrors, the kind that gives the best yet worst reflections brought doubt, the kind of doubt that had me terrified of the person I saw looking back at me. I was once afraid of love, the kind that evaded my dreams and had me drinking from a fountain of fantasies it brought hope. The kind that had me lost in brown eyes and chocolate skin I was once afraid to laugh. The kind that left me in tears, but ones, not ones of sorrow, ones that always brought joy. I was once afraid of the morning. The thought of repeating the same day scared me more than the shadows and the whispers that followed no longer were so soft, 
With every blink I saw mirrors surrounding me, revealing every role I tried to hide under my baggy clothes. I tried and trying to tuck away my misshapen body, but truly, truly, I was just afraid of me. Um, that was that piece. That was when I started <laughs> to actually open up about writing about myself. Um, which both pieces like A Colored Girl's Tale and uh, more pieces diving into the history of being colored, being African and being proud of that as well, but also writing about my country on a whole. So uh, I went on and I was very bold because of my love of history. Uh, when I finished high school, I wanted to study uh, political science and all these nice things. And then I got to figure out what politics is really like. And I'm like, no, Kim, you are too opinionated for that. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and you have a conscience. Uh, my mom said, you can't do that with a conscience. <laughs> so um, I decided that was not the right thing for me. Uh, <laughs> but um, I love that poetry going back to the first piece, we'll blame it on the poetry. Like I remember that song where they used to say, blame it on the alcohol, we're gonna blame it on the poetry. So uh, unfortunately for every person that's hurt us, unfortunately for every person that has either made us feel some kind of way or contributed to the traumas we faced, uh, when the truths are revealed through poetry, they just have to blame it on the poetry. If they pick up one of our books and feel some kind of way and feel guilty, about some things that they did or said that's on them blame it on the poetry um so with that being said uh this piece is entitled a lost country in the wrong hands you have fallen the passion held for positive change turned to greed when they had seen your potential we all baffled at how much you have changed we recall the days when we became when we once counted notes. Now all we do is stack up coins, hoping for change. We once sat around bonfires, listening to tales of what you once looked like, unaware that the very soil beneath our feet remi remains the same. Only thing is that times have changed. We fear what the next generation will be left with. If these are seen as hard times, how will our children handle the deck of cards that they have been dealt with? So on this day, on this day, we will file our report of a lost country, one that is easily bought from hand to hand, decreasing in value. We are no longer recognized. We no longer recognize the very soil beneath us. May our voices be heard in the chambers of where our fate is decided. May our cries for safety be louder than bank balance notifications. May our feelings of doubt and fear shake seats in high places as we file our report of a lost country. One which is rich in knowledge but never sought out for. One which holds wisdom but blotted out by greed and pride. Our hope, our hope is that we may be free once again. But for now, we will file our report of a lost country. So yeah, that, that was the uh, first piece I ever wrote on how I actually felt about politics uh, is in South Africa. And I will not apologize for it <laughs> ever. <laughs> you know, um, back in the day when I look at South African history, when I look at so many poets, singers, creatives that had to run away because of their pens being so powerful against an entire system, says a lot. Um, so I have two more pieces and I'm, and I'm running away. So I'm going <laughs> to... Uh, this piece, I think I just lost the page. I think I just lost the page. I think I just lost the page. Okay, that's fine. What makes me African? It surely can't be my hair. With its spiral curls that fall naturally down to my cheeks, my, my mother cringes at the sight of my once tamed, now untamed hair. Urging me on about the straightener that she has in her top drawer and her bedside cupboard. And the more I say that I'm fine, 
the more I see her eyes drawn more to my hair than my face during our conversation and my, my mind begins to wander off to the days my ancestors had to use hot curling rods and burn their scalps with chemicals just to look appealing in the boss's eyes while hate brewed in the madam's heart, maybe she foresaw my coming. A child, neither dark nor pale, but what makes me African? Is it the way I say Saubona without the English accent, staying true to my forefather's tongue, then twisting back to a wear what kind to fit into the streets of Wentworth or somewhat colored community or upgrading? So the tone needed to fit my level of intelligence in the workplace. Good day, sir. How may I be of assistance? And while I flip through these three tongues, a fourth one awaits me at home. It brings humor to my family with the way I say rugby instead of rugby. Bridge instead of bridge or fridge instead of fridge, but what makes me African? Is it my street smart mentality or the way I eat pap and nyama at a shisanyama? Is my big body not a reminder of Sarah Bartman enough to have you convinced perhaps? Perhaps it's my name, Kimberly. Not spelt quite like the place to think of it, my father almost named me Brooke. Or is it my family's legacy of poverty that makes me African enough? Not the malnourished, crusty faces smeared across your screens like feces version. Oh no, 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 no. I am not the face you felt compelled to donate to out of pity. I am the face of this rainbow nation when two worlds collided. And I am African enough. And uh, I'm, I'm going to run away with one last one. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I still have time. <laughs> um, You're sitting right at 15 minutes, but go ahead. Go ahead. Give us one. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this was a new piece. It's entitled When They Come For Me, basically because of, yeah, some backlash <laughs> with this book. When They Come For Me. <clears throat> when They Come For Me, let them take this God-given shell. Let them prove that words still hold power and my pen, bird scale force wins every time it kisses a paper. Let them continue to think that I am defeated. <laughs> Let their small-minded, short-sighted, ignorant faces gloat over the shackles placed over my hands and feet, failing to see that my heart and mind fly free. Let them know that Charlotte McGaike made me do it. The first black South African woman to obtain a university degree out in Ohio re-sparked the seed within me to thirst for knowledge once again. The mother of black freedom freed my mind to never settle nor blend in. So I will raise my voice and tell the stories of the elders. See, my conscience is clear of all sin. I spoke my truth. I spoke my truth in each poem of 30 years of a deluded democracy. When they come for me, let them know that I fed off the strength of the mother of this nation, Mama Winnie Matigizela Mandela, the face and force behind the anti-apartheid movement, detained, tortured, banned and banished, yet rising above with the words, there is no longer anything that I fear. There is nothing that this government has done to me. There isn't any pain I haven't known. See, if they dare come for me, let them know. <laughs> let them be sure to understand the outcome of their actions in case they had forgotten. So ask yourself, ask yourself if you're ready to go bare knuckle backyard fighting with this poet because the muzzle is off and so is my filter. See, I never fear death, only it's timing. But when they come for me, all fear of timing will be lost. I will stand tall regardless of my height. My voice will never be silenced, digging deeper into the shadows of untold stories. Tell us again what happened with the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. You see, you may try to silence my voice, but my pen will speak of the blood spilt in silence, breathing life into dormant pens, stirring up a tribe of poets unapologetically free to say what they need to say. <laughs> I know my name will be forgotten, but my teachings of love and truth will forever be a legacy worth passing down the line my daughters will know. 
They will know that I never flinched at your hand above my head, nor begged for mercy. Coming from a bloodline of strong African women, always ready for a fight. So with the Bible in my right hand and a pen in my left, come for me. Come for me, I dare you. Thank you very much. <laughs> god damn! Oh my god! Give me, give me, Ederson! Holy smokes! What? Wow, There's a fire Kimberly. news. Oh my god! Uh, where can people Woo! find you? Call you? All that stuff. Ooh, okay. Uh, you can <laughs> find me on IG. <laughs> yeah, I had to. I had to calm down because that piece said that. that uh, piece just slaps a little different my hands i mean i was about to throw my chair across the room too right and i didn't even write it so yeah i can imagine um yeah no um you can find me on ig uh you can find my book uh online on the radio green books website or you can contact me for a signed copy you can find me on instagram or it's kimberly underscore kma on TikTok, it's the same, Kimberly underscore KMA. I think there's an extra underscore there. Um, on Facebook, it's the same as well. Please do not follow the pages that are created in my name. I've lost access to those pages, but you can send me a direct message on Facebook as well. Um, and yeah, we've got also another feature coming up on the 16th. And there's a, a lot of other amazing notif announcements that are going to be coming out. So just be sure to check out the Red or Green Books website for everything else concerning the journey for Do I Look African Enough? <laughs> awesome. Y'all unmute your mics. Please give it up for Kimberly KMA Anderson. Woo! Let's go. Let's go. God damn right. Let's go. Um, yeah, straight up. Yeah. All right, moving right along. <coughs> Sensational, by the way. All right, moving right along uh, is, is Greg Michaels, right? Uh, so at Red or Green Books, we're, we're a female forward press, but we're so honored to publish these incredible men who come through the press as well. Greg is no exception. Uh, he's probably one of the first poets I met online and the most memorable. <laughs> Uh, he is, is, is sincerely, sincerely sensational. Uh, he is not like anyone else I've ever met. His work is not like anything else that's out there. Uh, he's incredibly unique, entertaining, humbling, and just like a wealth of knowledge. The man has done it all. Uh, his book is titled uh, Urban Cowboy Poetry. Uh, it is the uh, urban legends retold cowboy style, uh, cowboy poet style. He is just yeah, what an incredible way to end the show. So I thank you so much, Greg, for hanging in there. Thank you, everyone, for hanging in there today. And what a great way uh, to finish to finish the show today. All right, Greg Michaels, the urban cowboy poet, has been an indexer, an editor, an abstractor, a, liber a librarian, a technical writer, a stand-up comedian, a professional bridge player, a computer programmer, a roof thatcher, an assembly line laborer, and a wedding singer, but never a cowpoke. Heck, he can't even ride a horse. He has written comedy sketches, song parodies, and humorous articles and memoirs, and is now trying his hand at poetry. He has stolen the cowboy's storytelling style because he thinks it is a fun way to retell urban legends as urban cowboy poetry. He loves traveling, hiking, playing bridge, singing, playing saxophone, and making people laugh. His mission is to make the world a slightly funnier place. He believes in the power of humor to ease tensions in the family, workplace, and community, and to prevent or mediate conflicts. Greg lives far from the range in Cleveland, Ohio. He has two sons and two grandsons. You can find him at Urban Cowboy Poetry on YouTube and Facebook. I will read the review that John Burroughs wrote, and John Burroughs was the Ohio Beat Poet Laureate, but now is the United States Beat Poet Laureate. So here we go. Greg Michaels' urban cowboy poetry is a hayride of hilarity, a ruckus romp through urban legends told cowboy style. For years, I've enjoyed each of the many opportunities I've had to hear Greg share his poems at events around town. So I'm delighted, of course, that his best work has finally been collected into this fine volume. The tales he tells never grow tired. They've made me gasp, chuckle, snort, 
stomp my feet and chortle uncontrollably. So belly up to the campfire of your choice and grab yourself this heaping helping of Greg's unique and joyous work. What a great way to end the show, y'all. Unmute your mics. Give it up for Greg Michaels, the urban cowboy poet. Thank you. In my resume, I left out chess teacher and comedy traffic school instructor. Besides all those. Um, I want to thank all the poets for reading about, writing about fear and anxiety, fear and racism and depression and tragedy, so I don't have to, but I feel for them. Um, I never considered myself a poet. I was a comedian and humorist and musician and singer, but since I started rhyming, I'm considered a poet, even though the other poets don't rhyme. Um, but I love the cowboy poetry, but it's all about cowboy. And, so I had to find something else. So I I invented not my own form, but my own subgenre. Um, urban legends as a cowboy poet. I'm going to ask if people can unmute if they feel like laughing. That's my sure. favorite. Sure, unmute if you would like, you guys. That's my favorite sound in the world. Um, <laughs> this is probably Marissa's favorite. It's actually like the first urban legend I wrote. I love it. Let's go. Death by Dung. Yeah. Friedrich Riesfeld was a keeper at the Paderborn Germany Zoo. Friedrich ended up much deeper than you ever want to be in poo. His elephant named Stefan normally shat with regulation, but his bowels was out of step and he was fit with constipation. He'd been careful like a pet. What was this all about? 20 tons of food he had. For days, nothing came out. He'd been exercised around his pen to fed a healthy diet. Nor there anything to ease his pain. You know, Friedrich could try it. His animals were his concern. He'd stay all night and sit with a sick little look at Packarder who couldn't give a shit. <laughs> what an awesome task it was. Uncork a beast that big. First try, a bushel basket full of berries, prunes, and figs. Some laxative will do you good. You'll like it now, big fella. <laughs> Anyone in Germany would. It tastes just like Nutella. <laughs> they've, they've studied it like elephants do. They sniff with their long noses. It took quite a while before he was through. He had 22 doses. The final touch, an enema Fred made with olive oil. An extra virgin formula to make the bottles boil. As Fred got close and aimed a spray into the mammal's rear, he didn't know that, in a way, both their ends were near. <laughs> now, Steph, I've stopped your grumbling. I'm your biggest fan. Steph's entered started rumbling. Then the shit hit the man. <laughs> Fred dropped. Turned just a boo-boo and fall plum knocked him out. An amazing amount of doo-doo then proceeded to pour out. Or no animal nor human round when Fred fell in that trap. No hound came to rescue him in that there avalanche of crap. <laughs> he wished he'd been curating for some much smaller species. It wouldn't be suffocating near the waterfall of feces. Friedrich Mann is one last breath, his final respiration. Zuvets diagnosed his death. The cause was defecation. <laughs> one way or another, it became a worldwide scoop. Vermin keeper smothered by 200 pounds of poop. <laughs> now, I'm you thinking this story is odd, too crappy to be true. <laughs> the zoos are full of dirty jobs that someone's got to do. You won't find a truer fact in that almanac on your shelf. A friend of a friend of my cousin Jack overheard it his own self. Thank you. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so funny. It's so funny. I love it, Greg. Keep going. <laughs> this one um okay i'll just do this one fire diving on a hot day in the summer charlie did what he loved most he went scuba diving off the california coast no better way to keep cool than exploring in the water what charlie didn't know was that his day would get much hotter as he was hunting clams and flipping around and stuff from above, I'll do that, sorry. 
As he was hunting clams and stuff and flipping around from above the surf, he heard a whoop a whoop a sound. Charlie got to wonder just what this could be, and a brown metallic vessel started submerging in the sea. He felt himself being pulled aboard by some powerful suction. What the heck was going on? An alien abduction? Was Charlie being hijacked to some aqueous moon of Jupiter by flippered beings who think he's just like them, only stupider? No, as Charlie was Charlie's out there swimming around and playing scuba games, a hundred square miles of forest land was going up in flames. Corner flying saucers, just a forest. The US Forest Service had to set its plan in motion. They sent a fleet of aircraft to scoop water from the ocean. Corner flying saucers, just a forest service chopper, carrying seawater, fishes, crabs, and Charlie in its hopper. One minute Charlie's in the sea, then in the wild blue yonder. Next thing you know is he's fighting fires. He's become a first responder. When the pilot dumped his bucket on the patch he aimed to soak, Charlie landed in the branches of a blackened red oak. He dived the cook with tank and mask, flippers and wetsuit, but he forgot to bring along his fireproof parachute. Later, when the rangers surveyed damage they could see, they spied a curious crispy critter hanging in a tree. <laughs> Is that a bear away up there? One ranger had to ask. Not unless a bear would wear two flippers and a mask. <laughs> California firemen's wives were so proud of their spouses who fought to save the pot farms and the million dollar houses. If you'd asked old Charlie's wife, she'd have said the chance was zero that a scuba diving hubby would turn out to be a hero. When they ID'd Charlie, his wife cried, but her head couldn't be held higher. He was credited with extinguishing two square yards of fire. Fate's a bitch when a man goes diving looking for adventures and winds up burnt so bad he must be ID'd by his dentures. Okay, adrenaline is getting a hold of me. I'm going too fast and missing lines. So maybe I'll slow down a bit. <laughs> um, one of the most famous urban legends, Big Apple Gators. When you fly into New York, an awesome skyline is a greeting. On the surface, take a taxi to that most important meet. Low ground, go by subway to the restaurant or theater, but don't go any lower. In the sewer, there'll be gators. Now, how did alligators with their big old snappy mouth come to live below Manhattan? When you know they grow down south, did some genius say, well, noshing on his bagel and his locks? <laughs> what the city really needs is alligators or crocs. Now, they were brought back by New Yorkers wintering in the Florida sun who thought a dangerous animal might bring some family fun. They needed gifts for grandkids who might feel really, they might feel, they needed gifts for grandkids who might feel really hurt if grandma went to Miami and all they got was a t-shirt. Each grandpa had the same idea. I know what to get. I'll buy little Joe a baby gator for a pet. Joe will be the envy of every kid at school. He could use the family bathtub as the gator's swimming pool. At first, the little beasts were welcome in the family nest. Then they started biting and becoming a real pest. New York moms appreciated feeling clean and showered. They couldn't enjoy their bath time with a chance they'd be devoured. All around Manhattan, they cried, this just can't go on. And all the families flushed their alligators down the john. These reptiles congregated in the city's sewers of New York. And then they started breeding where it's stinky, damp, and dark. This started in the 30s, flushing baby crocodilians. Some were boys, some were girls. By now, there could be millions. There ain't no light way down below. And if you believe the winos, They've grown into a family of giant blind albinos. Criminals who hide below and see those big jaws snap will learn they're not the baddest bangers in that they're big apple. They found out, they'll find out soon enough that their zip guns and switchblades just ain't a match for a man eater from the Everglades. 
If you slip through and greet the beast of New York slow and sudden, you might think you fell to hell and met up with the devil. But will they come up and terrorize? I don't think they would. They leave the upper city to the pushers, pimps, and hoods. They ain't gonna swarm the streets if manholes ain't kept shut or swim up through a public dawn and bite you on the butt. No need to high up, hide up in the sky in a high rise elevator. Just be careful not to go too low. In the sewer, there be gators. Yes, 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 Greg, I love it, I love it, let's go. Um, gotta do Mikey. In my writer's group, they said, you gotta do one about Mikey from the Life commercial. A cereal company put three brothers on the TV screen and launched a tragic chain of events no one could have foreseen. It all started with this commercial. You try it. I don't want to try it. Let's get Mikey. He likes it. Hey, Mikey. That's how John and Jeremy happened to discover they could test all kinds of scary foods on their little brother. <laughs> They devised a wicked plan, these mischievous little elves. They try on Mikey all the stuff grown-ups keep for themselves. Most things Mikey didn't like. Cereal might be a flute. He couldn't stand the taste of beer. Daddy's cigar made him puke. They fed him coffee, caviar, foie gras, rum, and stinky cheese. Only mom's imported chocolate truffles seemed to please. So a sweet tooth was Mikey's thing. He'd rejected a dill pickle, but he enjoyed sweet sparkling wine and the way its bubbles tickle. So the boys revised their tests. They'd get him to drink or eat brandy, fruit, or crumbs of mint, anything that's sweet. They'd hook them on sweet cereal, but for them, that weren't enough. One day they introduced them to the harder stuff, rock hard candy the carbonated kind, the stuff that blows your stomach instead of your mind. He popped those <laughs> pop rocks in his mouth and they popped him back. Pretty soon his entire head had sustained a fizz attack. Mikey loved this new sensation. He was overcome with joy. His bros had found the perfect drug to hook this little boy. They had heard a rumor about pop rocks when they had to try. Just like little Mikey, they were on a sugar hunt. Mikey, you know that you could trust us because we're old. Pop rocks get a lot more fun when you drink a can of soda. <laughs> the more you eat, more fun you'll have, they told their little brother. He ate half a dozen bags of one, drank a six pack of the other. He hiccuped fast, his eyeballs rolled, he was bouncing around the room. He rumbled like a volcano. Then his tummy went kaboom. <laughs> their prank. Much to their horror, had done a bang up job. What used to be Mikey was now a pink and cola colored blob. Don and Jeremy started to cry. They were in a lot of trouble. They had caused poor little Mikey to overdose on bubbles. They missed their little brother, but what were they to do? They couldn't tell their parents he'd OD'd on CO2. They improvised the story, the first one that was handy. Mikey had gotten in a car with a man who gave him candy. The boys must live their whole lives with the consequence of their schemes. Each night, a bubbling, fizzing little Mikey haunts their dreams. Pop, pop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a nightmare it is. The whole family rues the day when they thought they'd try showbiz. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh I got one minute left, so I'll do a short, a very short one. The pants demic. Okay. The 80s saw a deadly trend amongst fashion-minded teens who didn't know the dangers of their shrink-to-fit jeans. This started with a billboard, Levi's modeled by a hunk who wore them in the bathtub till his jeans outlined his junk. Teens thought this skin-tight look would enhance their reputation. They discovered that their shrinking pants cut off their circulation. They planned get-togethers with music, food, and kegs but couldn't make the party with no blood going through their legs. One hottie bought the tightest pair of jeans that she could find, then soaked them to the limit just to show off her behind. <laughs> she was proud that she was fit and into dancing and athletics. 
till she had to have her 501 scraped off by paramedics. <laughs> they raved about this new sexy style with every other breath. Parents feared this obsession would lead to their kid's death. One couple told their daughter about a boy they knew who died. The girl, like all teens everywhere, assumed her parents lied. They don't want me looking hot, so they made up this fiction. Her cause of death was listed as crushing pant constriction. They'll want to wear them in the bath? Go ahead, you might get lucky. A quick shower would be safer. Leave the tub to rubber ducky. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be nominated, an honor to share with all these other nominees. Right. Awesome, Greg. Where can people find you? How can they get your book? All that good stuff. I put my chat stuff in the chat already because I was the last one. Urban Cowboy Poetry on YouTube and Facebook. My book, you can PayPal to UrbanCowboyPoet at gmail.com or you can message me if you want to pay some other way. Um, I just discovered a website's been resurrected. I made a <laughs> website years ago on a blog spot called WordPress. And then I got my own URL and paid for it. And then when I forgot to renew my subscription, they cut me and wouldn't let me use that uh, URL anymore. And I've been e emailing Urban Cowboy Poetry, you know, off and on for years. And it, just two days ago, this old one, Greg, Urban Cowboy poetry.wordpress.com showed up. It's awesome. there with text of my poems. I don't know if that's a good idea or not because I want to sell a book, but it's there for now. Well, hopefully. All right, you guys, unmute your mics. Give it up for our final feature reader today, Mr. Greg Michaels, the Urban Cowboy Poet. And thank you for laughing. I love that. <laughs> oh, my God. What, what is way to end the show, right? Uh, welcome, PoetCon Ross Faya uh, has joined us today. I'm so excited she is here. Uh, the original 10 uh, poets are, the original poets are here, uh, are coming in the house as we have our show today. Very excited. All right, so just to cap, just to summarize, first of all, congratulations, massive congratulations to the six uh, poets who have been nominated for Pushcart Prizes this year. We have to review, we have Patty Orozco's uh, Drenched Raincoats. There is Stephanie Eisler Vance's Made of You. Maureen Medina's My Fears Out Loud. Kun Davini by Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Do I Look African Enough by Kimberly KMA Anderson. And of course, Greg Michaels and his Urban Cowboy Poetry. Big shout out to Shane Maynard with Gorilla Poets out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina for helping to do five of the six covers. Uh, she is one of the four cover artists who we work with here at Red or Green Books. Um, if you have not had a chance yet to get on Goodreads and give reviews for these books, please do so. If authors, if you do not have your book on Goodreads yet, please get your book onto Goodreads. If you need help in how to do that, let me know. As soon as your book is on Goodreads, send me the URL link because I'm working with AJ Houston and a bunch of other uh, people from around the world to help uh, get reviews for you poets. Um, also, Greg's book is... Uh, uh, has uh, has illustrations in it. So you want to really uh, like the Mikey poem was hilarious because like I grew up really thinking pop rocks like will kill you if you drink it with soda. Uh, so but his book has these wonderful drawings by Shane Maynard as well. So if, if you have a chance, please uh, pick up uh, uh, copies of these books from the authors if you would like signed copies. All six of the books are bundled together for a lower price at redorgreenbooks.com. Red is R-E-A-D. If you have not had a chance yet to visit the website, please do so. We have a bunch of things coming up. We have a poetry summit happening right here in New Mexico the first weekend of June. Uh, tickets are on sale already for that. We have filled all of the featured reader slots for that. We have people from all over the world coming to that event so please uh, get all of that if you can Greg your hand is raised did you have a question yes remember in um, the book Death by Dung there was a missing stanza I have the insert yes. in these did yes you print it? so we haven't reprinted the book but we do have the missing stanza in on the page so it's just so don't worry about that but if you would like to get a signed copy from Greg go find him online 
uh, and and you can do all of that as well. I have it on good authority. Kimberly Anderson will be stateside next year. Uh, so you should start saving your money so you can buy a plane ticket to go see her wherever it is she's going to be in the US. Uh, you do not want to miss that. Uh, otherwise, next Saturday, don't forget our anniversary show for The Word is Right. We have 29 featured readers signed up to read. Uh, it is a, an incredible show. And we're going to be hosting New Year's Eve at The Word is Right as well, uh, dropping the ball at every hour interval for North America. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, thank you all so much. I think that is it. Go to the website, redorgreenbooks.com. You can find all of the links, the bios, the websites for all of these authors. All these poets are there. Congratulations. Uh, big announcement hopefully coming next week for one of our authors from Red or Green Books has been awarded a very prestigious award this year. So we're excited. Keep your ears uh, to the ground. Uh, keep checking the website. We'll be making that special announcement and most likely doing a very special reading show for that. Uh, and if you have an idea for a book, an anthology, something that you want to do, some sort of project, please email me, let me know. We'd love to make it happen if we can. Uh, thanks for all your love and support, everyone. Thank you, poets. Congratulations again on your Pushcart Prize nominations. Uh, I'm so excited to lead all of you. Peace and blessings, much love, and I'll see all of you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Yeah, wonderful. Adios. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. I think I have Marie's book, too. I just couldn't find it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Greg. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.